Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. Mass shootings continue to happen across the country, and just last week it hit home when five people were shot during spring break at the Isle of Palms. We talked with Clemson professor Dr. Robin Kowalski about the psychological effects of these shootings. But first, Governor Henry McMaster, along with SLED Chief Mark Keel, called on the legislature to strengthen gun laws. And Chief Keel joins me now to discuss how to keep our communities safe. Chief, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. So this week you joined the governor and the Isle of Palms Police Chief, Kevin Cornett, in calling for tougher gun laws in the state following that mass shooting at IOP over the weekend on April 7th. What measures do you want to see the legislature pass with, with less than a month left in session? S simply put, we, we need a true felon in possession law in South Carolina. Um, it's something that we've been working, about, working on for a number of years. Law enforcement has been talking to the General Assembly about, and, and that's, that's simply what we need. Um, we know that here in our country and here in South Carolina is no different, that a s small number of people commit most of our crimes. And we see that in our numbers this past, uh, this past in 2021, if you look at 2021. Um, we had 566 murders in South Carolina in 2021, the largest number we've ever recorded. 322 of those murders were committed by individuals less than 25 and 59 by people under the age of 18. Uh, we've seen a 52.2% increase in, in murders over the last 10 years. You look at weapons law violations, again, we see the same thing. We see a 4.1% increase in weapons law violations in 2021, 80.8% increase in weapons law violations over the last 10 years. 91% uh, of those violations are, are in, involve weapons, 76% handguns. Um, if you look at the total number of weapons law violations in 2021, uh, 9,728 and 6,500 of those weapons law violations were, were committed by individuals under the age of, of 25. So again, a two thirds uh, an individual. We need a, again, a true felon in possession law so that we can hold those pro prolific offenders uh, accountable uh, here in South Carolina. Can you elaborate on what a felon possession law is that for all felons? To it's for all felons. So what we would like to see in South Carolina is we would like to see our law mirror the federal statute. Um, we have in South Carolina an offender uh, who has to be convicted as a violent, of a violent crime uh, conviction before he is considered to be a felon. And we have crimes such as shooting into a dwelling or shooting into an automobile that is not considered a, a violent crime under our current statute. And so what we need, again, is that law that, uh, that mirrors the federal statute that really holds those individuals accountable. We, we take trafficking in drugs. Trafficking in drugs is a, is a prohibitor here in South Carolina. But we know that many times those trafficking statutes end up getting played down. And if they're not convicted of a, of a trafficking statute when it comes to drugs, and we see so many gun violations uh, connected to drugs in our state, then again, if they're not convicted of trafficking, they're not, a, they're not considered a felon and they're not prohibited from possessing a firearm. So that, that is one law that you want to see strength. And what about you know, illegal gun possession? A lot of these folks, I mean, we're talking about people, I think looking even back to the Columbiana Mall shooting last year, which is about a year to the date of this other mass shooting we just saw in IOP, um, that a lot of people have illegal guns, but they can keep getting these legal guns and keep getting a slap on the wrist, essentially. What more well, needs to be done I mean, to stop that? You know, we see, we see a lot of stolen handguns in, in people's possession. That came up uh, in the press conference with the governor the other day, and people say, well, you know, where do they get them from? Well, unfortunately, most of them come out of car break-ins. Uh, we see that over and over again in communities where people leave their firearms. They, they don't store them safely. They leave them in their vehicles. Sometimes they leave their vehicles unlocked. Uh, we, we see on uh, cameras in neighborhoods sometimes where these uh, criminals will go. They're not even breaking into cars. They're just walking down the street checking the door handles. If the door's unlocked, they'll get in the car and see what they can find. And we see so many of these guns that, that are, again, being stolen out of vehicles and uh, people are not safely storing their handguns. So do you want to see tougher possession laws, legal possession laws too, on top of the felon? Well, I mean, I think that, that again, the, the laws that we have on the books with regards to um, firearms on the federal side, uh, we just need to make sure we're enforcing them 
and again, what, what we would like to see here in South Carolina and what is in the House bill. Uh, what is in the House bill, the constitutional carry bill right now, is a bill that anyone who is convicted of a crime that carries a penalty in excess of one year is a felon and they would be prohibited from carrying a firearm. Are you worried when we talk about, you know, cracking down on crime again, making it, you know, kind of going back to the 90s where everyone said we cracked too hard down on crime and now we had this backlash. Are you worried that that's kind of slinging back around here or do you think that something needs to happen because, again, you're talking about 566 murders, the highest since the 90s? Yeah, I think we need to get back to where we were at in the 90s, quite frankly. Um, uh, I, I see it today, I, you know, during the 90s we were building more prisons, okay? Uh, the, the thing that I think is, is a cornerstone to, um, to South Carolina and whether we're recruiting industry or we're trying to get people to move to South Carolina, tourism industry and everything else, is the fact that we need to have a state where they, people uh, feel free to come and feel safe when they're here. And, um, and I think that uh, when I look at the number of people that were in jail, um, that were in jail 15 years ago, and I look at the number of people that are in jail today, and I've said it, you know, we, we had about 25,000 in jail at one time. We've got about 15,000 in jail today in our state prisons. And is there a correlation between that and the amount of crime we're seeing right now? We have to hold people accountable. There's, if, if people can continue to uh, commit crimes and there's no deterrent effect because they're not going to jail, they don't have that, that hanging over their head, they're going to keep committing crimes. And, and that's what bothers me. Chief, I want to talk to you a little bit more about some additional legislation in a minute, but you were talking about those numbers, those crime stats, and we're talking about uh, the murders, again, 566 in 2021. What do you see driving all that? We know we're also looking at um, decreases, there was increases in sexual battery cases, decreases in robberies and aggravated assaults, uh, but overall, what do you see driving these murder increases? I, I don't know. We've seen that increase over six years. I mean, we've continued to see a murder uh, increase in murders over six years. Uh, weapons law violations, eight straight years in a row, we've seen the increase in weapons law violations. Uh, we obviously have uh, an abundant number of firearms um, that are out there. Uh, today, you know, when I was in high school, if uh, somebody had a disagreement, you know, you'd come away with a bloody lip or a bloody nose. And today we got 12-year-olds shooting 12-year-olds. We got 15-year-olds shooting 15-year-olds. Um, I, I wish I had the answer to um, to why that is, um, you know. But uh, I just know that we continue to see those increases, and, and we have to have laws on the books again that allow us to deal with those prolific offenders, those repeat violent offenders, and especially with gun crime. And when you talk about repeat offenders, we've been seeing obviously also that big push for bond reform. You're talking to the governor about that as well this week. Um, you know, when you look back at that Columbiana Mall shooting, all three of those shooters were arrested and jailed on attempted murder charges. They didn't get bond. Uh, but when we look at the IOP shooting, one of the suspects, who's an 18 year old, was charged with unlawful carrying of a weapon, and he posted bond for $25,000. Right. What happens if he commits another crime while out on bond right now? Yeah. Hopefully, we'll lock him up and he'll go back before a judge and won't set a bond next time. I mean, our bond system's broken, and and you know when I look at uh, when I hear prosecutors say that uh, they've got 162 pending murder cases and 80 percent of those individuals are out on bond, that bothers me. Um, I, I don't understand that, and I can tell you that our fugitive uh, team here at Sled, we are continually rearresting individuals who are out on bond for violent crimes, and so I hope again that the legislature. Um, I know the governor is very much in support of bond reform, and the legislature is too, and I hope that they will pass legislation this year that will address that issue and, and try to keep these repeat violent offenders in jail. What about the constitutionality of bond reform? I mean, if folks aren't already convicted of a crime, can they be charged with another one at the same time But when it comes to that bond? Well, it's my understanding that in South Carolina, again, if it's a violent, uh, a violent crime, that they can get a no bond. And, and I, I think that... Uh, I know that during COVID, um, you know, the courts were not wanting to necessarily put more people in jail because of what we were all dealing with in, in, in that environment. But um, but we've got a whole we've got a whole repeat violent offenders accountable, mm -hmm. and the only way we can do it is the court. We all have to work together as a partnership. The criminal justice system does not work without uh, law enforcement, the courts, the uh, probation, parole, and pardon. Department of Social Services, mental health, mm -hmm. 
We've got a huge mental health issue in our country as well, and, and here in South Carolina. And we all have to partner together and work together as seamless as we can to try and hold these individuals accountable. You feel like we are doing that right now, working all together? I hope we're headed in that direction. Um, I, I do believe that, that we're headed in that direction, and I think it's based upon the fact that, again, we continue to see these numbers increase, and I, I think that everybody understands that we it's, it's no one part of the system that's, that's, that can do it. We all have to work together, and I'm hoping that's the direction we're moving. And I'm assuming you're pretty hopeful, too, since we saw the Senate pass that bond reform bill back to the House, which approved it prior in the session. I, so it seems I like am, I'll make it to the governor's desk. I, I am, and I I'm, have no doubt that um, that it will, hopefully it will get passed. Hopefully, again, the House and Senate will come together. I guess they'll probably have a conference committee maybe on, on that bond bill and come up with a bond bill this year and, and get that passed and get it to the governor's desk for signature. Chief, we have less than five minutes left. I want to ask you about this constitutional carry bill. Uh, that passed the House, too. It's in the yeah. Senate now. Do you think that's a good bill? What are you, do you have any concerns about people carrying without training? I have, I have great concerns about it. Um, I have never supported that. Um, but at the same time, um, I will tell you this year, we've uh, law enforcement, uh, a lot of law enforcement associations have been sort of neutral on it. And we've been neutral, neutral on it because we, we are desperate to get a true felon in possession bill, and that is in the House bill. And uh, we have to, you know, when we look at uh, open care with CWP last, last year when it passed, um, a lot of folks were concerned, obviously, that we would see people open care and everywhere. Uh, I've not seen that. I travel all over the state all the time. And I'll be quite frank, I've not seen one single person uh, carrying open care. Is that just a, a handgun or a, a long gun? Too? Handgun. Well, long gun was not, a long gun was not prohibited already. Mm -hmm. So... I've just not seen it. Um, I know talking to some of my local uh, local sheriffs, and especially in rural areas, they've seen more of it than I have. But um, but again, I am concerned about it. I am concerned about uh, people not having training. I'm concerned about people not uh, having training with regards to how to store a weapon safely, just like I was talking about leaving it uh, in automobiles. And I'm also concerned um, about an individual carrying openly that, that legally does not know when they can use that weapon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and seeing, again, a law-abiding citizen using it at the wrong time who, who do not know what the law is and, and could end up being held accountable for a crime. So a lot of concerns just to get that felony possession law passed, which probably should have been on the books years ago. I remember hearing hearings about that back in the State House years ago. That We've talked about it for a number of years. Law enforcement has, has talked about it for a number of years. And again, we hope that um, we hope that this will get us across the finish line this year. Chief, another big issue we see, you know, there's always that talk about defunding police, et cetera. Um, have you seen any fun, like, uh, staffing level issues across the state in terms of, you know, backlash to policing right now, or what's it look like in South Carolina? We have a significant uh, vacancy rate in South Carolina. Uh, the Sheriff's Association has done two studies. They've done them in November of uh, 2021 and November of 2022. Um, in November of 2022, the latest study they did, uh, there was about 300 law, 290, 300 law enforcement agencies in South Carolina. Uh, only 114 agencies responded to that survey, but it showed we had 4,114 vacancies. Um, a large number of those vacancies were at SCDC and Department of Juvenile Justice, but it showed that it was about 1,700 vacancies in in. Uh, first responder type law enforcement, your city and county law enforcement, where when you have your house broken into, that's who you're calling. Mm -hmm. And so it is a significant problem, not just in South Carolina, but across the country. Uh, we continue to see that, and, um, and it concerns me very much, having been in this profession uh, 45 plus years now, um, it concerns me that we don't see young people wanting to get in this profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know where we're going with that. With about 30 seconds, I want to ask you just about fentanyl and, and the increasing overdose deaths that we've been seeing, according to DHEC, uh, from 2020 to 2021. Deaths involving fentanyl increased more than 35% in South Carolina to 1,494 deaths. What's being done to crack down on this? What more do you guys need? We need a trafficking in fentanyl bill, which, again, we've got, uh, we've got two bills that have been introduced, one by the House, one by the Senate, drug-induced death by the Senate. Uh, it's been passed and gone to the House, and then trafficking and fentanyl is passed by the House, gone to the Senate. We hope both those bills pass this year. And again, I have said, and this is not a political statement, but this 
administration that we have in Washington, D.C. has to get their head out of the sand, and they have to do something about our border. As long as our border stays open, we're going to continue to see deaths because of fentanyl. It is pouring across our border at unprecedented levels, and it's going to kill a whole generation of young people in our, in our country if something's not done about it. A lot going on in the country and our state. That's Chief Mark Kuehl Sled. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Robin Kowalski is a psychology professor at Clemson University, and she joins us now to discuss school and mass shootings in her research, as well as mental health. Dr. Kowalski, thanks for joining us again. Thanks so much for having me. So, Dr. Kowalski, we've seen horrific mass shootings remain in the news, including school shootings. Uh, there was that horrific shooting at a school in Nashville last month that left three adults and three students dead at the hands of a 28-year-old woman who was later said to be a trans man, which means he used male pronouns. <clears throat> and now no evidence linked the shooter's gender identity to the motive for the attack, but the Nashville chief of police said a sense of resentment may have played a role in that shooting. Can you refresh us on your research and some of the background when it comes to school shooters and what motivates them to commit these heinous acts? Yeah, I'll be glad to. So in the research that we've done, and, and when I talk about, you know, antecedent conditions, I don't in any way mean to profile. Um, but, you know, these are just things that a lot of the shootings seem to have in common. And we've come up with five primary um, predictors, antecedent conditions. And one of them is um, a long-term history of rejection, for example, being bullied. Um, and, you know, of course, we know that people are bullied for anything that makes them stand out as, as different um, from what, people, what particularly kids consider to be the norm. A second predictor or antecedent condition is a, um, an acute rejection experience, like maybe they've recently broken up with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Third predictor is a history of psychological problems. A fourth one is a fascination with death. And then the last one is a fascination with guns and, um, and or violence. Um, but, you know, to get back to my, my sort of qualifier with that is, you know, there's lots of people who have mental health problems who don't become school shooters. There's also, you know, lots of young people in particular, kids who are bullied, who also don't become school shooters. Um, so it's just these are factors that, you know, sort of create particularly collectively a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And then, Dr. Kowalski, when you look at this situation, it was, it was very unique in the way that you typically have a, I don't want to say a stereotype, but you pretty much do when it comes to a school shooter type. How did this change that, that dynamic? Yeah, so most of, most of your school sh shooters, at least the ones we've studied and that other people have studied, you know, in, in our research, 95% of them are white heterosexual males. Um, and so, obviously, this is different, um, you know, in, in the sort of... Um, demographic profile, if you will. Um, but, um, you know, we haven't seen the manifesto or anything like that yet to know, you know, the degree to which, you know, any specific thing um, with the motive behind this particular shooting. Mm -hmm. And when you've seen, you know, I, I know we can't really speak to that, like you're saying, we haven't seen any manifesto or any details there, but when you talk about transgender, transgender issues, I'm sorry, uh, it's become such a flashpoint in society nowadays, too. And we've seen the, sh the fallout from the shooting, uh, you know, with many pundits, many, many politicians uh, using this to drum up fear, maybe also pass some anti-transgender legislation. Um, this rhetoric and fear seems to be ostracizing folks that are already marginalized in so many ways and folks who are actually at higher risk for actually being victims of violence or, or higher suicide rates. So how do you see these kind of repercussions? Uh, what kind of repercussions would you see, I, I should say, from the result of this when it becomes like this firestorm? And, and when you talk about being bullied, for example, and the repercussions of that? So, you know, the first, my first response to that is I, I think focusing on that is misguided. Um, you know, with all the other shootings, we haven't made a huge issue out of the fact that most of them have been, the vast majority have been heterosexual males. Um, so, you know, if we're going to focus on this, for the Nashville shooter being, uh, you know, transgender, then, you know, we, we should have been doing that. You know, if, if that's going to be our focus, then we should have been doing that with all the other shootings with being heterosexual males. So I think that's mis misguided, that, that the focus on that is misguided. Um, the second part about that, and you, you laid that out so well in your um, setup for that. I, I think it does highlight that, you know, you said people who have been marginalized. Um, and in my opinion, that, that's where we need to put, focus our attention is whether it's because of their gender identity or because they have been bullied for some other reason, you know, it's people who are marginalized who've been made, in my opinion, who've been made to feel like they don't matter. Um, we need to make these people feel like they matter. Um, you know, we need to develop, you know, bullying prevention programs in school. They, there are some, but we need to enhance those programs. And, you know, I think to the degree that people feel like they matter, 
um, and that they are not marginalized, then, you know, those are not the people who go and typically perpetrate school shootings. So I think that's where the focus needs to be, not specifically on the gender identity. And instead, we're kind of seeing the opposite play out, at least when it comes to policy issues too. But of course, um, more, more is needed to be done at the school level as well. Uh, but uh, just before we wrap up on this one, it was also interesting too that it was a 28-year-old shooter, uh, you know, not a student there. Uh, they were previously back when, I think in fourth grade, but then you know, kind of, it seems like came back maybe for some sort of retribution. So very fascinating to see that kind of dynamic at play. That, that's pretty rare as well, I'm assuming. That's very rare. Yeah. At least according to our research, the median age for the school shooter is 15. Um, so, you know, that she was, or he um, was considerably older. Um, and you know, what that shows you in, in my thoughts, again, we don't know a, you know a lot yet because the manifesto hasn't been released and we don't know what that manifesto, manifesto is going to say, but it suggests that some of those effects of, you know, maybe being bullied as a child or, you know, whatever can, can have, those effects can be really long lasting. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, it just maybe has, you know, just accumulated over time. And, you know, maybe now, you know, they had the, the means and the resources and the availability of the guns to, to act on it. Very interesting to think about. And when we talk about this need for mattering, which we were just talking about, we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to elaborate yeah. on that concept a little bit and how we can be better about it because, you can mesh that concept <clears throat> with some other shootings we've been seeing, uh, unfortunately, going on across the country. Yeah, so by definition, what mattering means is, you know, making other people feel like they're important or significant. And the converse of that is people who, who feel like they don't matter. Um, you know, we could call it anti-mattering. And, you know, people who feel like they don't matter sometimes say that they feel invisible. Um, and again, prior uh, previously, you mentioned the term marginalization. And, you know, you can imagine, particularly if you're a young person, maybe elementary, middle, you know, school, being at school and feeling like you're in, invisible. Um, and so, you know, sometimes people who are invisible want to be seen. Um, so, you know, one way to be seen would be to perpetrate a school shooting. So I, I think that there are so many ways, really easy ways that we can go about making people feel like they matter. And Dr. Kowalski, kind of along those lines, too, we saw that horrific shooting in Louisville at that bank on April 10th, uh, yeah. uh, where five people were killed. Uh, the shooter was apparently suicidal, had a history of depression, uh, was apparently about to be fired, perhaps. I know a lot of these things you said just because that you have mental health issues doesn't qualify you to be a shooter in that regard. Um, but, you know, what do you see as like a root problem for a lot of this? I mean, are we just a broken society because we have such a higher prevalency for these shootings than other countries across the world? Well, I think, you know, I, I don't like to get into gun control debates when I'm, you know, doing interviews and things like that. But I do think that's a critical issue. Um, it's just availability of guns and particularly for mass shootings where the perpetrator's older, you know, they can access the guns legally. Um, and, you know, states differ and, you know, the different regulations and um, that they have for availability of those. But, you know, I know that um, in that particular state, you know, there's there are no restrictions really for, for access to guns. So mm -hmm. I, I think it is. Um, you know, I'm not going to state a particular opinion about people's right to bear arms, but, um, you know, I, I think we do have wide availability to guns that in other countries um, it doesn't apply. So, I, you know, if you, you know, you know, without guns, you can't have the shootings. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Dr. Kowalski, since we last spoke on February 10th uh, to now April 12th, there have been 84 mass shootings nationwide that have left 113 people dead and 308 injured, including five South Carolinians who were killed and nine injured. Five of those injured uh, that occurred during the April 7th shooting down at the Isle of Palms. There was a horrific murder, suicide in Sumter in March that left two adults and three children dead. Um, just a lot to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I want to kind of talk more about news consumption in this last question I have for you. And, you know, we get these push alerts on our phones. We get these tweets to our phones. Uh, then we start following what's going on with the shooting. We see the aftermath. Maybe we see victims' stories. We get to learn about these people. Then we see body cam footage from these horrific shootings too, replayed on our TV screens. And as we scroll social media, this all makes for some sort of collective trauma, I have to assume. So I've recently heard this, this term, uh, problematic news consumption, which I guess is another way of saying, you know, information overload. So what can we do to help ourselves maybe limit this, maybe prevent ourselves from going down a spiral that can lead to, again, some trauma and effects that we don't even know the result of? I, I think you said the word. I think we need to limit it. Um, I think in, in addition to this, I, I do think it produces some trauma. Um, but at the same time, I also think it produces some desensitization. Um, you know, the more we 
watch these things and become exposed to them or the more podcasts that we listen to about it. Or, you know, it's not that those things are bad, but in mass doses, they really can lead us to become desensitized. And, you know, we hear about these things and it's like, oh, there's another one. Oh, another shooting. Um, and we're still drawn to the information, but they become so just become so commonplace in our minds that I think it is, is leading us to sort of downplay the seriousness of it. Um, and I'm concerned about that moving forward. Gotcha. Well, thank you for helping us digest these traumatic events and um, hopefully we won't have to meet under such circumstances in the future, but it's hard <laughs> I hope, to say. Yeah. Yeah. That's Dr. Robin Kowalski. Yeah, She's a psychology professor at Clemson University. Thank you again so much. Thanks so much for having me again. To stay up to date with the latest news throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that hosts on Tuesdays and Saturdays that you can find on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.